We're, we're not the typical real estate investment club. We, we don't sell you guys anything. So the entire point of for investors by investors is that there's no sales pitch allowed. And uh, actually, Ellis and Jeremy up here were two of the founders. Sorry to leave you out, Ginger. The two of the founders, and uh, they were sick of going to the, the real estate clubs and getting getting uh, pitched boot camps and books and tapes and all that stuff. And you couldn't really rely on what the speakers were saying because you don't know if it's truth or not because they're trying to sell you something at the end. So we wanted to actually, they, or they wanted to start a place where um, people could go get educated without having that sales pitch involved, without having to worry about you know the, the upsell at the end and how much, how much thousands of dollars it's gonna cost you at the end and things like that. And so, and, and a place where people can get educated as well as just network and find the relationships you need to do real estate because really all of us up here have found that the networking through real estate has exploded our businesses significantly. When, when you learn how to, how to develop relationships with other people and really build wealth through combining the resources in the room, it's one of the most powerful things you can do. When I learned how to do that, my business exploded. And I can tell you that these guys will tell you the same thing. The return on investment for your dollars and your time for networking is huge. So um, I'll go ahead and um, let you start off. And that, that's kind of the intro to the group. Um, and what, what, what you're going to explain kind of what we're doing here at this group. Yep. It's different? OK, go ahead. Yep. So yeah, so besides these two being founders of Phoebe, Matt Owens is also one of the, the I guess, the triumphant of the partner, partner within the Phoebe <laughs> brand. Phoebe is uh, 15 chapters around the country. 13 of them are located here in, um, in Southern California. I love the story whenever Jeremy tells it that when Phoebe started, I think it was, what, six of you guys at a Starbucks? No, no, four. 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 <laughs> I didn't mean to exaggerate. Including um, me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> did you buy the coffee or did you make I did not buy You did not buy <laughs> See, next time you start a real estate investment club. Uh, and I think there's over 2,500 people now? Yeah, we have actually, I haven't counted, but we're probably up to close to 4,000. 4,000, yeah. wow. So um, the power of networking, right? And, and the reason why this brand has grown so quickly is because there's so much useful information. On your chair, there's actually a list of all the Phoebe meetings um, in, in the South Bay, and I believe there's some in San Diego, there's some in uh, Palm Springs. Every Phoebe group is different. Um, the, the concept is the same. It's no selling. It's strictly educational purposes, but some focus on broader uh, investing as a whole. Some focus on, uh, like ours, like real estate. So, you know, you, you have a list in front of you. Um, so take a look. If there's a topic that one of these other groups covers and you're interested, you know, we we encourage you to continue to, to network and find out more information. Panelists, when I introduce you, uh, give us a good you know, three to four minute introduction uh, with two <laughs> things. First of all, tell us what you specialize in, and then also tell us about how you got started as a real estate investor. And um, first up, we have Ellis San Jose. So Ellis. Oh, great. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. How I got started. Um, I started fixing up houses with my dad in Ventura County in the uh, 70s and 80s um, when I was in high school. Uh, so I would fix up rental properties with my dad, and that's how I got started. Uh, when I went to college, I met up with a group of foreclosure investors that bought properties at the courthouse steps in Los Angeles. And uh, when I started with them, we had 10 properties. When I left, we had 200 doors. Uh, to me, that was the best education I ever got because I really hated going to class, but I loved <laughs> going to work and seeing properties being bought for 15, 60 cents on the dollar. Uh, I specialize in uh, distressed property and notes. I buy a lot of uh, debt, uh, debt that is non performing, and I make it performing again. Uh, another way that I like to put it is uh, I'm a rehabber of, of notes. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> I like them because I don't have to swing a hammer to, to do that. <laughs> um, what was the other part of the question? Um, well, you kind of answered. What do you specialize in? Oh, we're specialized. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for, for showing up. Ellis El El had, a, had a great quote that I'll never forget. When, it, when uh, I was talking to him, one of the first times we met, he was telling me about um, the returns he got for, for one of his investors. And he said, it's, it's like they just keep coming back. It's like real estate crack. As soon as you get, as you get a great return, they're just going to keep coming back. <laughs> it was, I'm like, that is an amazing quote right there. It's hard to manage the expectations when you have one that you hit out of the park every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. Right? Great, great. Well, uh, 
So right. yeah. yeah, next up we have Jeremy Roll. Okay, great. And I just want to thank these guys for organizing this. our 15th or 16th chapter. We've kind of lost count, but um, th this is a great <laughs> format. I think that if any of you are able to come back, you know, different speakers, different topics over the months, it's probably going to be really valuable from an educational perspective. So, um, so I'll try and keep it somewhat short. <laughs> I, do, I do a lot of things. Um, so uh, my name is Jeremy Roll, and my story goes in 2001, after the stock market crash, um, and I'm a very slow and steady kind of low-risk guy, I was really sick and tired of the volatility in the stock market, so I started to look at alternative investments. And um, by 2002, I had made my first investment, but I, I'm basically a, now a full-time passive cash flow investor. So I was looking for passive managed opportunities, which is my focus, which is actually different than the two of them. Um, just because at the time, I was working actually at Disney headquarters in Burbank. I didn't have time to really do anything actively. So. I got lucky. I started investing with lifelong friends of my family. I was very worried about where the money was going with the first deal. I was afraid it was going to end up in the Bahamas, literally. <laughs> I'm serious. So uh, I started with them, started to learn, actually started to go to a lot of meetings around town. And uh, to make a long story short, um, fast forward to 2007 and a half, I had rotated all of my investments from the typical you know, Fidelity 401k at Disney and stocks and bonds and all this uh, into uh, cash flow alternative investments. And um, I had a last straw moment in the corporate world. I was happy getting my passive cash flow and getting my W-2, but I just got really fed up with the current new boss that I had. So um, I had the, the, I already built up the, um, the, the kind of the cushion or the, the base uh, cash flow. So I decided to kind of make a bet on myself and leave the corporate world and it turned out to be probably the best thing that happened. Um, so I've been a full-time passive cash flow investor since 2007. I've become much more diversified, and thanks to all the networking, to be honest, and to the FIB, I've really been able to diversify into a lot of different things. Um, I now invest, which we'll talk about a little bit about tonight, some real estate and non-real estate items. Um, uh, but um, you know, aside from the focus tonight, I also invest in other cash flow opportunities like ATM machines, um, some natural gas royalty land, uh, some cash flowing websites. I do a little bit of equipment leasing. I do some accounts receivable financing, short-term loans that are collateralized or secured, um, and uh, other stuff too, um, as well as all the traditional you know, single family and multifamily and commercial real estate, both in the US and Canada. Um, I also manage a group, I built up a private investor group at this point, a few hundred investors, and they're all looking for very similar investments to me, which are all kind of low risk, passive cash flowing type opportunities. Um, a couple other very quick facts. I'm a, technically, I'm a licensed real estate broker in California, but I only use it for investing purposes. And uh, I have an MBA from Wharton back from 2000, before this all started. And um, what else? I just really, I have a passion for investing. I love investing. All I do is either network with other investors or look at opportunities every day. So I would encourage you, end the meeting. I love to network and talk to anybody. And if anybody has any questions about any of our FIBI meetings, um, there might be other meetings that are really well suited for what you're looking to do. So. Feel free to come to any of us and ask us, you know, even which meetings we suggest based on what you're looking to do, because hopefully we'll save you some time and you'll find good meetings, even if they're not FIBI meetings as well. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. Thanks, Jeremy. Perfect. And last but not least, Ginger Marcius, who braved the fireball in the 91 freeway oh, to get yeah. here. <laughs> There was an accident, they closed it, I looked in my mirror, I was the last one through. Nice, nice. I was meant to be here on time, too. <laughs> so my name is Ginger Messias, and I'm a full-time wholesaler. Um, actually, the, this month would be four years exactly since I did my first deal. Yeah, yeah so I'm so happy that I'm in real estate. Um, before that, I mean, I was a scientist before that for a lot of years, worked at the county, did a lot of research, and I didn't think I would love anything more than that. I wanted to go work at the World Health Organization and just like, you know, heal the whole world. <laughs> I was like, oh, never mind, that's too much work. So I quit, <laughs> became a full-time uh, wholesaler, and I haven't turned back. I mean, I've been, so my first actual deal was three deals in one. I wholesaled two, and I kept one for a rental, and I still have it, and I have passive cash flow. So I love it. I love real estate investing, and, uh, and especially if you're starting out in real estate, I, I recommend wholesaling. Uh, you really learn the ropes by wholesaling. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. So um, we're gonna go. Out, uh, I'll go ahead and start by asking. We, we designed some questions so that you, these guys could could answer. We gave them the questions first, so they kind of know already. You know, but it's kind of unfair. We're gonna spring them with. How's your family, Ellis? No, I'm just <laughs> no, um, 
so uh, I'm going to start with Ginger, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, what is it about non-rental real estate that, that you actually like, like the wholesale practice? What, what is it that you really love about that business? Well, I know how you said real estate, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> As a wholesaler, you're looking at tons of deals, hundreds of deals, and you're out there, I feel like I'm on a treasure hunt. And, and then you just get your payday, you move on to the next one. Payday, and, you, and now your payday depends on how much work you really need to put. It's all up to you how much work you want to put into it. And creating systems, I mean, I, like I, I was a scientist before, so I had to create systems for whatever study I was doing. So now I just use that same skill set and I create systems in my business. So that way I'm not always chasing the deals, now the deals are starting to come to me. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's like the best thing. Just setting just, up the system so it runs for you, basically? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. So the deals just come now uh, a lot faster than they did when, when I first started, that's for sure. And how do you, how do you go about liquidating some of your product? Um, I have a really good <coughs> cash buyer list. And by going to meetings like this, meeting people, telling everybody what I do, you know, talking to rehabbers. And actually, your rehabbers who are on your list, they're your free mentors. Because they're telling you, this is what I need, this is how I evaluate it, go find it for me. So you learn a lot by being a wholesaler. And take advantage of your buyers, you know, because you're helping each other out. So, yeah, wholesaling is <coughs> yeah, you, it's a learning. You learn everything from a lot of people. Cool. Well, what about you, Jeremy? What do you, what do you like about the non-rental real estate market, you know, all the other stuff you invest in? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that, um, um, well, first of all, I, I focus on cash flow. So the way, I, the way I like to tell people, I'll invest in anything that cash flows if it makes sense. And what I mean by makes sense is typically if you can mitigate the downside risk. And a lot of that has to do with like loan to value, for example, for those of you who are lending hard money, you want to make sure there's enough padding or cushion, I like to call it, so that if something goes wrong, you can take back an asset. Same thing when you're doing a traditional loan against a traditional asset or company. Um, and what I like about it, frankly, is that it really allows you to diversify. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I like to say these days that the opportunity that lies ahead of all of us, I think for, personally, I think for a number of years still, is that we're kind of, we can be the bank. And, to an extent, that means that you can actually get really good terms, really interesting interest rates, and you can frankly command the structure. And if you can kind of slowly but, um, but surely learn about structuring and learn various ways to structure different deals, um, you can put yourself in a really good position. I mean, you can combine, when you combine your education about structuring, all different types of investing besides uh, tenant base, mm -hmm. and have the network, those three are very, very powerful, especially in this time right now. So just the diversification is really great. Jeremy's taught me a lot about structuring different investments, and that, that's everything. The structure of how your deal is. I mean, it's it's where are the incentives based? Where how, how are you? How is everybody getting paid involved in the process, and how are they incentivized for for performance? All of that kind of stuff combined is is huge with the structuring component um, from <laughs> rental and non-rental real estate. So. Um, Ellis, uh, you're, the, you're the big fish on the, on the non-rental real estate side because uh, <laughs> you're uh, so focused on notes. Yeah, so. I, I really like notes. And, and when people say, well, what's a note? It's basically you, you're buying debt. Uh, and I only buy secured debt because uh, uh, Jeremy talked about is you want to have a cushion, some sort of certainty of, of your, your exit strategy so that you're never in the same position as, say, I don't know, Countrywide or <laughs> the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae, you know, those, those type of uh, lenders that really don't uh, don't uh, have the same motivation that we do because uh, when it's our money and our investors' money, we have to make sure to take care of it. Um, I like it because there's an ability to scale that you can't do when you have rental property. I have probably as much rental property as I want. Um, it, uh, it, it, it takes a much more hands-on approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really admire what Matt does because I realize what it takes to run a, a tight ship when it comes to managing rental property. Um, I have no desire to scale up in that sense. Uh, I still want to have rental property because of some of the qualities that, that it has in an economic environment, but I really like the notes because when I, when I was saying that I don't have to swing a hammer, it's, it's literally about um, you could do a lot of the work with a phone and a laptop and uh, I've got three young kids, and it really uh, lends itself well to my, the lifestyle that I, that I see myself uh, having. So um, when, when I buy a note, there's, if I do my homework right, there's very few ways that I can get hurt. So. You got those computer hands or the... the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got kind of no, no calluses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's called <laughs> yeah, yeah. Car carpal tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Too much sliding on the iPad, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, the second question is actually one that the gentleman back here asked. Uh, it's uh, about finding solid opportunities to invest in. And, Jeremy, I'm actually going to ask that one to you first. Um, do you invest passively or actively? Um, actively. Okay. Um, 
I'm not sure if my answer would apply necessarily. I'm a passive investor. The, the, the way that I invest, because I'm looking typically for managed or um, kind of passive opportunities, it's all networking for me. A lot of the opportunities I invest in, are not, they're not allowed to market. So if I find people marketing those types of opportunities, I know to stay away from them because it's illegal to do it. Um, so by definition, I have to network all the time to find opportunities. And when I, when I honestly, when I think about, I, I've actually given presentations before, when I think about how I found almost every opportunity I could think of, there's always some type of networking story behind it. It was either somebody referred it to me or I met the person. And actually, one of my favorite stories is the first meeting at Starbucks when we were mm -hmm. four people. Uh, you know, my first FIBI way back when, five years ago. Um, there were four of us. I was one person. Another person was selling some books and tapes. And then there was an ATM operator who I, I now have invested with for four years and a flipper who I've now lent hard money to for years, uh, multiple, multiple deals. So two out of three, just from that one two-hour meeting, which I got very lucky. That's typically not going to happen. But, um, you know, networking is a lot of work. But once you build a network, it starts to pay off. It's almost like a cumulative effect. So. Um, I don't want to make it sound like you know hard work is the only way, but I can tell you that it does work. So, and uh, a lot of what Jeremy invests in is is syndicated pooled investments. That is what he's saying. You can't market for those types of investments just because it's illegal through the SEC. And and developing those relationships and and slowly doing all your homework on those deals is the only way to actually really start to invest in those types of things. Um, his business structure and the types of investments he invests in are a lot different than, than uh, Ginger and Ellis just because of the, the syndicated nature of that. He invests in other things too, but syndications are a big part of it and should be part of everybody's portfolio at some point just because um, you want to you want to invest in managed portfolios, but also want to be active at the same time, so that you're getting you know the higher returns of your active workload involved, but being able to invest that money into passive investments that slowly build your wealth at the same time as you you trying to build your wealth through through the active investments. Um, uh, you want to um, okay, Ginger, you want to same question to you? How do you find your deals? Yeah, same thing, networking, um, and it is a lot of work. I mean, to find those deals, you have to network whether it's on the phone, making connections, asking people for connections. I mean, I ask a lot of people, do you know where I could get, you know, whatever deal I'm looking for? Oh, yeah, I call so-and-so. So most definitely is networking, calling. Right now I'm getting a lot of my deals from the MLS, uh, calling agents. And then actually, but not just from the MLS. But I, the way we are doing this at the office now is we're not really looking for a deal, per se. We're looking for the agent to make those relationships. And then once we have those agents, they just start bringing deals that they know that we like. And, yeah, it's all about networking. So, so those agents bring you the deals that may not necessarily be up on the market for very long because right. they know, hey, you're a buyer, you're going you're gonna to get it and, and right. move it quickly. Yeah. And it's, it's all relationships then, it's basically. all relationships, okay. everything. So we're also doing, starting to get into commercial uh, wholesaling. Same thing. We're building our list of agents and just making that contact. And we're always just recontacting them and making that connection. Ginger, are you getting like off-market and pocket listing type of, of listings? listings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of agents who have REOs, they, they have direct connections Oh, you know, we just got this list. Take a look at it. You know, they're, they're giving us the, you know, like a three-day window to put in offers. So, you know, take a look at the list, and you know which ones you want. So we're getting them like that. Cool. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, where do I find opportunities? Um, I'm going to kind of answer it in this way. Um, one of my mentors uh, talked to me about, you know, how do you want to design your business? Do you want to have a volume business where you're, you have a system in a factory where you're cranking out? All these deals with this certain margin, or do you want to be specialized where you do maybe four or five deals a year, but you know really fat margins? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I kind of like the lifestyle of not having a big staff and everything, so I decided to go after very very specialized niche. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to kind of help you is, um, what would you say you're looking for right now? Um, I'm not looking for the factory, not looking for the big overhead. So uh, I go this space. Fix and flip a home. It's gonna uh, pour you in and out. You know, six or eight months, realistically speaking. Um, you know, it depends. Just, yeah. What I'm really worried about is that I'm really lazy and I couldn't compete with Ginger. She worked way too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to pick something else sim simply because I'm not smart enough to do that long. Um, so you you want to find a niche that there's a problem, there's an inefficiency in the market, and that you can solve it. And um, 
and people say, well, just show me what it is, right? And I'm like, yeah, great, Here, here's my business plan. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you right now, I mean, it's in front of us, and why, why I decided to jump on it was, when a bank needs to unload a loan, because they don't have a certainty of what's gonna happen, how many buyers understand what that value is? I have to say that in this room, and, and we're in a very bright room, there's probably a large amount of you that, that can understand a wholesale deal, that understand certain things, but if I said, okay, Here's a second trust deed with a first trust deed and a tax lien, and you gotta figure out what's the value. So the more you spend on your education, your specialty, the more you're gonna have a, a thinner field of who's competing. Because I, I, I really hate competition. Because I, I really, I, I never wanna be in the position where I have to kind of beg for a deal, you know what I mean? Where you're like, oh, oh please let me buy this house from you. Never have I ever been successful when I have been a motivated buyer. If that makes sense. So I really would encourage you to find specialized niches, and and I always like if, if my son my son's nine years old right now. If he came to me and said, "Dad, how do I get started?" I would say, "All the problems in the world are usually recorded in the county courthouse." <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the county courthouse that is public information, and the harder it is to find, the better chance you have of being maybe one or two people that are going after it. And then if you actually know how to solve it in a creative way, you really put yourself in very rare, in, in a very rare uh, field of, of uh, problem solvers. And my mentor, he does that, and, uh, and he routinely buys property at 20 or 30 percent of value, of value, routinely. So I mean, I want to get to that point. <laughs> and, and a lot of um, Ellis's education, and, and I've been educated significantly on the same guys. There's a couple of guys by the name of Gary Johnson and Clyde Wilson that teach a lot about notes, how to be creative on those types of transactions and things like that. You guys can look them up online. Great classes to take. I took a, a, a weekend course from them, and it was unbelievable the knowledge base that I was able to get from those guys alone. And just continuing your education is huge. It's really, I mean, you wouldn't think of it. If you've got a good system going, you're making money and things like that, I mean, it's great, but at the same time, if you don't continue your education, that income source could slowly go away as, as markets change and by you not being on top of things. So staying on top of that education is huge. But, yeah. yeah. I also just want to say, like, what you're talking about, about Gary Johnson, those guys are great, but um, for you guys that don't know uh, the people in the room right now, there's a lot of really serious investors that are succeeding at a really high level. And so um, I try to really establish my relationship with them because they're – for those of you who don't know, I was joking earlier when I was talking about Matthew. Let's talk about Matthew. Um, but like everything that they say to me is really, really valuable. Just like you know, information from a lawyer, or doctor, or something like that. So I just wanted to mention that. No, oh, thanks. Um, who, who here in the room actually invests in notes? Can I, can I get a? Uh, okay. And who who in, who wholesales properties? I know I got some more people. Who's trying to wholesale property? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're we're in California, so it's kind of hard to get them. You know, I understand. You know, so just make sure your rehab numbers and your market values are right, and you'll get a lot more sales on the back end. Um, and who here actually invests in alternative types of things like like syndicated investments, businesses, um, you know, and alternative types of income sources? A couple people in the room, and, and I can tell you the businesses and alternative investments can be just as lucrative as these, these other methods that they just take a different type of education base. So learning all these different aspects of investing in different ways through, through you know, notes, through wholesaling. Ginger is more running a business, wholesaling. It's an active, active business. Uh, Ellis Moore, he's very active up front, but once it's set up in place, you know, um, there are some issues that can happen down the road, but for the most part, it's a passive type of deal. Jeremy does the same type of thing where it's a lot of homework up front but once it's set up and running, you know, it's communication ongoing to manage those investments, but at the same time, you can see how much work that, you know, Eris, Ellis and Jeremy do up front. Ginger actually makes it, uh, does, does work continuously, but then actually has a system running and a business running for, for success, too. I couldn't so, do it by myself. Yeah, yeah you have I to have, have those teams. How, how many? Nine. Oh, my God. <laughs> I have a lot of buyers. <laughs> I have a lot of buyers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard managing people too. So it's it's an important lesson too. I mean, for for those of you that are new in real estate and and those of you who have been around know this. It's important that you understand your own time frame and how much energy and time you have to give to this. You can't build a portfolio and then spend all the time being managed by your portfolio. 
you have to know what you can give to it and then build a portfolio that you can manage. That, that's a really important part as a real estate investor because if you start buying something, even if it's a great deal, but you're spending three times as much time as you thought you were, you're going to be completely unhappy with that investment. So it's all about doing some <coughs> introspective looking into yourself as well. What do you want to put to this? Ginger's got a whole operation with nine people. It's her whole thing. If you've got a full-time job, you don't have time to do something like that. So what can you do? What type of investing can you do that you're going to be personally happy, happy with, just not financially happy with? 